in my talk today, uh, I put up an agenda. I would like first to introduce what is the evidence base of telehealth within the last 20 years. Uh, what can we learn from the recent studies of implementation at telehealth at scale? What are the barriers and what are the facilitators? I would like to give some examples to you after I've tried to sum up where are we now and what can we do to overcome and move uh, the process further. I've uh, taken up two uh, research projects that I'm involved in myself that I would like to introduce and I would like to come up with a few more examples. And then by the end there will be time for questions, so, so please uh, feel free. I know that telehealth, I can see even by coming over here, I thought I knew, I knew what you were talking about when you talk telehealth. Many of the things that you include here, we would call telemedicine. Uh, for example, when you transmit the data between uh, ICUs and so on. So there's a lot of words, and I call it a jungle of terms, telehealth, e-health, connected health. But today I will leave it by telehealth, and what I probably most focus about is home monitoring of uh, people with chronic diseases. Telehealth, moving to scale, how do we get there? Well, we all know within this field, uh, and I think there are many of you who are working in this field, we've all been involved in feasibility studies. When you have a little gadget, you want to try, you want to test it. We do some pilot studies, and we can do many of these things in the lab, or we can just go out in one or two homes and try it out. But how, when we have a good idea, how do we get it to implementation and implementation at scale? And I have to say, at scale is uh, very different. In Denmark, we say scale when we have 1,500 patients, and that's just a normal randomized controlled trial here in the States. When you talk scale at the Californian telehealth network, it involves a lot more p uh, patients. But what are the barriers and what are the facilitators? I'll try and sum up on the literature. Some of the areas where we have gone to implementation. Last week, uh, many of the uh, experts were gathered in at UC Davis for a seminar, and here uh, people agreed upon that telepsychiatry, teledermatology, and teleradiology are areas where we have got the documentation, we got the evidence, so here we have moved. So maybe we also can learn from these areas how had that proceed. What is the evidence base within the last 20 years? I would like to take up the article of my, one of my research colleagues, uh, Richard Wooten, uh, who made an article in 2012, where he summed up articles uh, submitted within chronic disease, five chronic disease, uh, asthma, COPD, diabetes, heart failure, and hypertension. And as you can see, there's an increasing number of publications, and of course that's very nice because that means there's a lot of activities going on. But out of this 1,324 studies, only 141 were randomized controlled trials. This number and the sizes of these trials, they are shown in this figure, and you can see that heart failure are one of the areas where they've done many studies, and the least is COPD. The trials uh, are very different in uh, how many patients they have had and also the interventions that have been used. So in the first uh, figure, you can see that uh, there are up to a little under 1,000 patients and another shows that it's a very short di uh, duration. Most interventions, when we talk about this, is under one year. And I'll come back to this about the intervention because that, that there seems to be a lack of studies and knowledge on this. We can also see at, that the increasing number of publications has been from the middle of 2005 and up to till to date. Uh, Wooten here is uh, summing up in his article that there is a tendency just to publish the positive results. So he called it publication bias. So I guess it's because uh, it's not so popular as a researcher sometimes, especially if you are young who wants career, do you want to publish all oh, the patients that said no to participate in this study. I think we're seeing more and more papers, and in my preparation for this talk today, I found more papers also from different uh, review articles summing up on results, and I think we have to learn from that. I myself did a, 
a project called the Telecap project on COPD patients, and that was telerehabilitation of COPD patients across sectors. We, evo we um, elaborated a concept where we could uh, do home monitoring of uh, COPD patients across sectors between healthcare centers, district nurses, and hospitals. We had a randomized control trial and had 111 COPD patients participating. The intervention group, they had the um, technology for four months, and after the four months and over a 10 month period, we could decrease the readmission rate with 54%. The telerehabilitation program was also uh, cost effective, and 10% of the patients, though, they said, oh, we don't get any effect of this. We only participate in this study because we have a nice GP. So I think that's worth, and I'll come back to this uh, later. And uh, one of the patients said, I do not, do, do not want to measure my values every day. This study has been um, uh, inspiring for a national plan on telemedicine, and I'll also come back uh, to, it has been inspiration for a multi-center randomized control trial between Norway and Australia and where I'm participating myself. I have another big study that I want to, to make you aware of, and uh, it's the biggest telehealth study in the world so far. Uh, it's called the Whole System Demonstrator Project. Uh, it's in England. It is a cluster randomized control trial, and uh, it was based in three local authorities areas in England. Over 3,000 patients participated. 845 patients were randomized to telehealth and 728 patients to usual care. It was patients with heart failure, COPD, uh, uh, or diabetes. They had the equipment for, for 12 months. There's been very high expectation towards this study because it was the National Health Service that initiated the study. And uh, last year, uh, the results came up. Um, and uh, it turned out that uh, where there was the highest difference was on the mortality rate. And uh, as you can see on the intervention group, uh, the mortality rate was almost uh, fallen by 50%. So that was very nice. But on the other parameters, there was not that big difference. So the conclusion that came up last year at Easter time was that the quality gained by patients using telehealth in addition to usual care was similar to that the patients receiving usually care only and total cost associated with the telehealth intervention was higher. Telehealth does not seem to be cost effective addition to standard support and treatment. This was very disappointing for a lot of politicians and also for researchers and people who love working in this area. Well, there has been some um, discussion about how did they run the, the, the study. The researchers themselves, they have also come out, out with some critical reflections about it. They looked, uh, first of all, of 36% of the patients who were screened for participation. And they said they did not want to participate because they were afraid that it was a threat to their identity, independence and self-care. And they also were afraid of the requirement of the technical competences. And they also thought, oh, was this um, not the same service as they were used to having? The researchers from the, uh, the team also said that doing a, a randomized control trial uh, was a barrier because the deployment of the telehealth seen with organizational perspective was a, a, a barrier because they couldn't just evolve it and do the organizational learning that came along. Because maybe sometimes the staff, they have very good ideas on how to implement, oh, why don't we just do this, or why don't we do this? Oh, and then the researchers on the other side say, we're here, no, it's an RCT, so you stick to the plan, Birte. <laughs> so that's, um, so, and they also said, well, we couldn't adjust the telehealth services to the individual patients. So my question is, why is it that when we start implementing at scale, we want to measure at the same time. Why don't we just implement? We do the same in Denmark. We have a big project there. We implement and we measure at the same time. So we're doing the same failures like they did in England. <laughs> so what can we learn from some of these studies um, at scale? 
Well, I have uh, put the barriers into different uh, perspectives, and the first is patient. And when I started making this um, a PowerPoint slide, I thought, oh, should I put it all in one? But I think we need to look at the barriers that they have changed over time. And we're here in California, where you're just heading and you've got very good ideas and you're far ahead of what we do in many areas in Europe. So I think I tried to put, divide them up in a, two different times with 10 years of difference, because I think for, for worldwide, the first from 1990 to 2000, it was the adoption of technology seen from the patients. But I think that today, that the patients, they adopt the patients, the technology, but the question is to match the patients with the right technologies. Because if you've got arthritis, you can't use a touchscreen. I had an elderly woman here just in January before I left over here. She said, Birte, I can't use this technology. I got arthritis. My fingers can't go on it. So that's maybe what we want to do now. Um, there were some ethical issues. I did my PhD around this time, at this time. And here we talked about being under surveillance. I had one patient said, it's better being under, uh, be, I'm, I don't feel being under surveillance, I feel being looked after. So I think that has changed. I think we can put that in the cupboard. Today it's more an ethical issue about privacy and my data. Who has my data? What do they do with my data and all the data you can get? Clinically, uh, they didn't use in, this, uh, in the, the first time period the technology so much and there was also a lack of evidence and a lot of feasibility studies. For the last 10 years, I think what we need to do is to also identify the barriers is that we have a lot of companies doing a lot of advices. Sometimes they forget to ask what are the patients need. Hopefully we see a lot of more user-driven innovation where we ask the patients. Um, so we need some stratification tools too, because some of the studies that we see, we have one device and we give it to 600 patients and they get the same equipment, all of them. But what about if they, one would like the mobile phone, one would like the tablet, another one would like the, the Philips, the, the body. So, so maybe we should take that into the account and that might give us better economic analysis of the data afterwards. Many of the interventions, they are very short term. You can't, when you go in and you want to start a new study up, see, oh, what, what's the good time to do a study with a, a patient with high blood pressure or with COPD or heart failure? Is it one year, two years, one year? So we need to have some more systematic approach on when we plan our study and how long time we do the interventions. Technically, I think we are here and you all know what the barriers they were and what they are. Um, you have been far ahead with, with all the work you have done and Dr. Nesbitt from UC Davis have done a lot on uh, getting the California Telehealth Network to come so you can come up in remote areas. But we still have some lack of coverage also in Europe where you can go on the mobile internet when to transmit data. We still need standards. We've got some standards. We still need interoperationality. And we still need to go over the, the, the issue of one size fit all. And then I think this is one of the, my most important uh, issues. I think they all are very important. The organizational. The mindset of the healthcare professionals is very important. When I started doing research in this area, a very important issue was that the healthcare professionals thought that the technology, when it moved tasks between the healthcare professionals, would make them lose that job, and it was a matter of jurisdiction. And there was also, in the first time, a lack of education. I think that today, within the last 10 years, it's more a lack of systematic education. I think we educate, but maybe not the right way. Um, here it was also a relationship between the patients and the healthcare professionals. I think today we still need to work a little more on that. We, we haven't come there yet. And here we, we have a fragmented healthcare system and I think we will still have that uh, in, in many countries. Economically, we need the reimbursement system. We have needed that for the last 10 years and we still do. 
But I think uh, that we are getting more aware of how to, to overcome it, and I think there is more political focus on it. So I hope that the politicians, they will move as fast as the technology maybe is doing. <laughs> In the beginning, there was no attention from the political side. But I think now maybe, and I can feel it in Europe, but, but also maybe a little bit here, and I know of course we're in Silicon Valley, we need to have some movers, we need to do it. There's a lot of hype. <laughs> but I think we still need to be realistic. We need to remember, even though we have good uh, education systems and good welfare systems, there are still patients who can't read. I'm working a lot with a, a, a term called health literacy, e-health literacy. Can they technically cope with this? Can they read what's on, on, on the medicine glass? What about the medicine adherence? Can we use the technology to help the patients cope better with their uh, disease? And then this triple aim has given the telehealth area very high expectations, better quality of, layer of, 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 uh, of care. We need to save money. But, but how is it when you build a new hospital and you had to look at, is this hospital effective? Do you put in all the, the cost that it costs to build the hospital when you judge if the hospital is effective? No, you don't. But I don't think sometimes we are fair on the way we look at telehealth because you do the cost effectiveness, you put in all the cost and compare it to the usual care. So maybe we need some other uh, glasses when we look at that. And here we have had a very close dialogue uh, and benefited very much from, I think it's eight workshops we've had, uh, Steve, on maybe we should put on some glasses uh, and say, could we take a non-inferiority and say, uh, approach and say, well, it might be better quality, but might not be cost effective in the beginning. And then to myself as a researcher, we had to be critical on our own issues too design, creating evidence, and publication bias. And I think that for the last, more studies came up, but what characterizes the study was heterogeneity. And we have compared studies where you use a phone and a fax and a mobile phone and a tablet, and it's all telemedicine. Maybe we should divide it up <laughs> and make some more clear studies. And we need to be better to create the evidence for the politicians in a faster way. Um, and also to publish, why do the patients say no to participating in a study? Well, I don't want to uh, shut off the light for telehealth. I like it very much, but I just want us to be realistic. Mm -hmm. um, some of the uh, English uh, researchers who is working on organizations and telehealth have analyzed the literature about implementing at, at scale. And I think they have made a very interesting article where they're using a normalization uh, theory. I won't go into it all, but I say four headlines are very important when you do this. And that is that healthcare professionals, they, it gives sense for them when they're working. That they don't feel it's a burden. We know both here in the States, in Denmark, Norway, Australia, they are busy, the healthcare professionals, both out in the communities, the DPs, and so on. But it has to make sense. They also have to participate cognitive. They have to be a part of them, because if it's not a part of them, if they don't use tablets when they go home from work, why should they use it at work? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> enrollment. And also, it has to be a collect collective action. So, it's, it's the team who is doing that, and not just you know, the one who is in, in front of everybody. And then you need to be more reflective upon how you do your work and how can we do it better. And it's not always the technology is working, we know that. But I think this is, uh, it's worth looking at if you are working with scaling up telehealth. The facilitators, uh, I put them in the same. And I think the patients, they are really facilitating telehealth a lot. I think they are the ones, it's, they're not always the barriers. They, they want individual care, they want treatment, they want tools for self-management, they want technology that facilitate interaction so they can go online. They don't think that emails is taking them away. They think they, they even have a better contact. Some of my own research have shown. They like the mobile technologies because they don't want to be dependent. And one thing I think we miss a lot in the literature, I'll come back to that, people who are working. Can the technology use them? That's very important. 
clinically, we need stratification tools. We need to be better to give the right technology to the right patients with the specific needs. We need guidelines because right now, I think you're the, one of the only countries, maybe few in Europe, who have developed guidelines. And I know that the American Telemedicine Association have done a, a great job on that. We need the long-term interventions too, so that we can keep the people out of the hospital. And we need program. And technically, we need user-driven innovation. So we ask first, what are your needs? And then we try and develop and standards. And we need to be better on the infrastructure. Organizationally, I think what can facilitate getting to scale is really a learning culture and new models enabled by technology and not technology first and then the care, but it, is, it has to be enabled by the technology. And of course, the reimbursement uh, system. But I think politically, I hope that we could get the politicians to be more realistic. I think it would really make the field get going because it's like in Europe, we have a vacuum. Because evidence, evidence, and everybody wants to have their own project. We're doing the best project, and now we're going to come and give you the, the evidence. Research-wise, we, we need to be, maybe we should identify some standard outcome measures so that we can compare our studies, make multi-center uh, randomized controlled trials in an international context. That's also why I'm here and <laughs> I'm working with the, with the Cleveland Clinic and Citrus and UC Davis so that we can, can do the meta-analysis. Now I would like to give you some examples how I tried in my own research to overcome some of this. The first project is a large-scale project on tele-rehabilitation of heart patients. I come from a university where we work problem-based, and that means we always start by seeing what's the problem. Uh, in this study, we have included patients who had a heart attack and patients who have just undergone uh, heart surgery. 3% of 86,000 patients they um, are ho hospitalized and they only receive a rehabilitation program. Mortality rate is increasing by 37% if you don't stop smoking, if you don't do anything life change changes. In the US, it's only 10 to 20% of heart patients that do after heart surgery, they follow a rehabilitation program. In Europe, it's estimated to be 35%. <coughs> Another American study shows that only 10 to 25% of heart patients were offered rehabilitation. And all this lack, how do we get the patients to participate? Well, we started by doing user-driven innovation. So we had a lot of, of workshops with patient companies, healthcare professionals. So the aim of this study was to identify what were the patients and relatives needs for rehabilitation. How did they live their lives? We wanted to develop a telecommunication uh, program for their patients. We wanted to prevent readmissions, but also to get them uh, earlier back to work. Uh, because it's a very big expense in Denmark if you are on sick leave. We use a lot of money on that. But also to explore the patients and families as being more active in their own process. So instead of making one size fit all, we developed two scenarios. The severe ill heart patients are the patients who have had heart attacks several times and who are in and out of the hospital all the time can be a heart failure patient. We did a little feasibility study. I won't get very much into that now, but on our homepage you can follow it. But we developed an intelligent bed for heart failure patients. So they could be weighed in their bed in the morning. Sensors that could make how much are they moving. It's very important for, for the blood circulation. But we also developed a scenario that we call the free and active heart patients. Opposite COPD patients, many of these patients, they can go back to work. In, in Aalborg University Hospital, they had a big survey where, where the head surgeon, he had operated on surgery over 600 patients. Only 20% went back to work, even though he said all of them, the operation succeeded. So there's something we need to do different. So what we wanted to do here was to have the patient have their own 
a personal health record and be able to exchange data with all the partners. We have done it in the northern part of Jutland. We have, we have 11 municipalities in this area and there are lack of staffs. So we knew we had to collaborate across municipalities. We had a call center to, uh, to uh, monitor the data uh, from the patients. So we had like five uh, locations and then we had the Aalborg University Hospital who had the thoracic patients. By having them being able to do rehabilitation activities way up in scale, they could save a lot of driving. They could really get some good benefits out of that. So we did a randomized control trial and at the moment uh, we are analyzing our data. In fact, here in June, the project uh, are coming over here and we're doing a workshop because we want the Citrus people to give us review. We don't want to be, uh, we want to have them beat us a bit and see if we, what we can do with our data. Here is our backbone in the study. We wanted to be as flexible so that we could, because by having this equipment, we had like the body of Philips, this was from Tonstall, where we could measure blood pressure, pulse, and uh, ECG. They had a tablet. If they didn't want the tablet, they could use their own computer. And then we gave them a Fitbit. And we had a triage system so that we could monitor many patients. And they could see the data at the hospital outpatient uh, center. And then we developed what we call the active heart. Um, and from my previous studies, I knew it's very important that when we want the patients to take up the role of being active in their own health, they need some tools. And I think we need some more research on this. So we develop, based upon this user-driven innovation, what we call a heart portal. And in fact, we had a professor, Greg Niemeyer from Citrus, who came over and helped us in a workshop. So that's really where we have benefited from the collaboration here with Citrus and UC Davis. On this portal, um, we have a lot of students, engineers, like you have here, and they are very good. This was three from Iceland. They developed this very nice concept. The patient can go in, read information. We have over 80 videos where the patients tell in one minute about a certain theme. It can be medicine, it can be cost or whatever. So they have been very happy for this as a tool. After surgery, you often are in a crisis. You can't remember. We don't know if it's the heart lung machine that makes you lose your short uh, term memory. So for them, they couldn't, they didn't look at it for the first month, but after the first month, they could go in here when it, it was nice for them to see a video and hear another patient telling about how to get going again after a surgery. Patients who had had heart attacks before, many, maybe three, four, they didn't like the page because they said, we don't want to be reminded that we are heart patients. But we got some experience and we have been measuring, we have done surveys on this e-health literacy to see can we be better and use the social media in the collaboration with the patients. Here we have some of the first data. John, he made them for us, Steve. <laughs> With the Fitbit, the patients, they had the Fitbit for three days, no, for three months. And here you can see in average, this first patient has gone 6,259. And it's really been a success for the patients. It was something they could count on. It was very easy and the data was transmitted so they could see it on the, on the tablet. Here what the patients, they could follow all the time themselves. They could follow their blood pressure, they could follow their pulse. Even here, they could follow how they lost in weight, and here how were the, uh, the steps they were going. And we got positive feedback on having these numbers to, to, uh, to look at and to guide themselves, even though they were in interaction with a healthcare professional. So the, uh, the, the budget, we have two PhD students, and we had a budget of 2.2 million uh, kroner. So this was like an example of how we try to overcome and make a sustainable program across municipalities by organizing, making a new model of care with a call center. And I think uh, it's not that many places in Europe that we think like that, but I think we need to, to do that when we develop these programs. I told you 
before about the Telecat project. And um, after we had done this project, we were invited to participate in a project uh, from Norway in, uh, called the Norwegian uh, Center for Integrated Care and Telemedicine in Australia. Because they wanted to do a long-term interventions on COPD patients. The COPD patients who really have the worst degree of their disease. So what characterizes them are they don't, they don't come out of the door, they stay at home and they have a difficult time of maintenance of, of what they do. Medicine only eases the symptoms. Uh, so th the things you can do are physical activities all the time. And they have limited access maybe to programs. So we wanted to make, we, we're going to start at the fact at the moment I'm working on the protocol, but we will start here by after uh, in August when I'm back in Denmark. So it's the uh, Norwegian Research Council, and what I want to illustrate by this is that the Norwegian Research Council pays for, for it in Australia and in Denmark and in Norway, and I think there's a tendency to open up for that also in Denmark, and I can see Mikkel, he's, uh, he's nicking too. So what we don't want to do, it's a three-year study. They had to train on the treadmill at home for two years. In Norway, they've had some very good examples of, of, on, on uh, a COPD patient training. They had one patient who usually went out on his boat to go fishing. One day, his engine didn't work. He's been practicing for a year. So what did he do? Of course, he took so he could row, row ashore. He was able to do that suddenly. So we're very excited, and I'm very excited about this because this is not a very nice little gadget that the patients have. How will they react on having that? But, but doing it across uh, three uh, sites like Australia, Norway, and Denmark. So I think this, this shows maybe also a way of getting quicker results if we work together internationally. And I also want to make you aware of that Europe have made uh, the biggest uh, research program so ever called the Horizon 2020, uh, where there are funding you can apply for. And I've heard about projects. I have a colleague at Olbo University who have partners from Chicago. She got a very big funding for um, a phantom pain, where they're going to develop new technology. So, so please be, be, be aware of that also. Um, so here you can see the, the three partners. Um, so I think that the future research, time is coming for, for questions now, uh, will have to be, we, we need to be more focused. We need, of course, to move along and we need to follow you here in Silicon Valley. It's lovely being here and your energy and your everything you got. But what are the patient's adherence to this technology? We also need to assessment of the patient's need and characteristics of the technology. We're doing a study in fact, at the moment, on heart failure patients with Cleveland and Denmark and, um, uh, and Davis, yes. The long-term interventions, think about it when you plan studies. But we also need a more holistic implementation approach that's needed. And one thing I think I forgot is project management. If you want to go on, on in large scale, why do you always pick a new team? Is it because the team want to go on the front page of the newspapers? Why is it not the experienced people who go there? I've seen that in many projects around the world. And there are more articles that do that. Use the experiences. I can see that UC Davis are getting a lot of context on how to implement it. And I think that's very nice and the competences they've got there. But we need faster results because the politicians, they're only there for four years at, at a time. So they can't wait for me to do a study <laughs> in three years because then they are out and, and on the road again. So we need to work together on large scale projects and we also need to do some multi-centers. So it's not the champions who are doing the studies and come up and have a lot of criticism afterwards. Oh, it's because you had a hand on every patient. So I think there are some, a lot of learnings we can do and then I think we can get the telehealth going. Yeah. So uh, I think that was my uh, presentation for you. So I'd like to. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you very much. That was a really great presentation. Uh, so trying to find out uh, what is this study shows the transformation of patients with the behavior modifications. How is this program really shows the behavior transformation? <coughs> We are analyzing on it. We are analyzing on, um, I, I've got the microphone. We are analyzing in e-health literacy. We are analyzing on depression score because many of these heart patients, they, they can be depressed afterwards. We are doing it on uh, um, the measurements on how much they walk, the physical activities. And what we also do is the way, how, how have they used the active heart? We, we, we take log files to see what have they been looking for of information. So we try to make a triangulation of, of the data. And then we also do a qualitative interview where we interview the patients and their relatives to see what, what are their uh, experiences on, on using this program. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, I was wondering if your heart patients had any all other um, diseases, for example, blindness or partial blindness, or were yeah. any of them in any way um, incapacitated in terms of using the equipment? Yeah. Yeah. The second question is, um, you, you talked about meta-analysis in the analysis of the articles. Uh, was there any solution or resolution of some of the barriers that you talked about found in any of the literature? Yeah. Thank you, very good questions. We had three patients who hardly couldn't see. And uh, one of the things, when we just had the equipment, of course, you know, when you do a project, you have a certain amount of money for equipment. But we had the Tomstall monitor. And they have, de uh, have developed it over years. So they have the voice. So when the patient, they are measuring their, uh, their blood pressure, it's saying, Mr. Jensen, your blood pressure is so and so much. So this, did these three patients, they were able to use the technology because we thought we didn't put that in the inclusion, exclusion criteria. So that surprised us. So we were happy that we had a series of equipment so we could design it for, for the individual patient. Then you ask about the meta-analysis. Yes, we have studied the literature on the heart area before we started this project. And it's not very positive. Nancy Albrecht that we work with from the Cleveland Clinic, she says, oh, the results, they are not that very good. A big study uh, published by Sondry in 2010 in New England Journal of Medicine. The patients, they had the equipment sent at home. 30% of them didn't open the technology. So we knew we had some barriers. So what we did was the patient had the technology taken with back home, but after two weeks we came and visited them to give them more education. At the moment now we're taking up these challenges in an Invita project doing with the Cleveland Clinic and Citrus and UC Davis here. So I think, and Dr. Nancy Albrecht says that ATA won't even put it into the guidelines of heart failure patients telemedicine, so there's still some issues. So it seems like COPD is one of the clear issues, but we seem to forget that some of the results in this heart area are not that positive, or maybe we have to do it in another way. I think that's how we have to argue. It's not because it's not working, but maybe we should plan our studies or programs in, in a better way. Hi, thank you for the excellent presentation. You, you mentioned that um, in terms of ethical considerations in the literature, you saw a shift from concerns about surveillance to privacy. And yeah. I wonder if you could talk more about privacy. In what sense you mean privacy, if you mean, uh, or if you're saying uh, data privacy or personal privacy, decisional privacy, and yeah. what you think about that, what could be changed? One of the things that has surprised me, because I've been a researcher in this field, field since uh, the beginning of 2000, that was, you know, being looked after, that's very nice. We gave the patients a Fitbit in the, in the teledialog project, and we thought that everybody would be happy about seeing how, they, how much they walked. And then we had one patient we came up to in, in Skane, very north, and we had to go and do an interview with him. He had had very bad experiences in the healthcare system, so he was happy for this concept about being involved, so he said, oh, this is what I've been waiting for. When I came for the last interview with him, he said, I said, why didn't you use your Fitbit? I'm going to use it when this study is over. 
I don't want you to see my steps. I don't want you to see that on Tuesday I play card. I don't want you to see that. I even gave the Fitbit to 20 clinicians yeah. and even myself. I didn't want to join the group because I work too much. I don't exercise enough. <laughs> so there are some issues. So I think privacy, we might have a lot of data and we have to work on big data and algorithms and have the engineers here in the room helping us developing that. But there are some issues I think that we, we haven't been able to identify all. So um, now when we're analyzing our data, I think we'll come up with more of them. Thank you for the talk. Uh, so building on that, I'm just kind of curious, not with a, I don't have a background with you know, hospital settings. Do you apply some, or could you apply some scoring mechanism to these patients? So you're, you're looking at blood pressure and pulse, and then over a period of time, can you, is that, are there rules against that, or could you, have a score and that how, see how that score changes over time. You know? so, so this patient either is decreasing their risk of their next events or increasing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in our first study, the Telecat study, uh, we had some uh, students, engineer students, looking at the data of the saturation. And in fact, we have applied for a pattern because they were able to identify a pattern when the patients were trying to get an exacerbation. So that means if you can see to the time when they are starting to having worsening of their symptoms, maybe we could help them. So now we're working on making maybe an algorithm, and of course we need some big, large studies on this issue with, so we can get the data. So I think we will see more of that. Uh, so I think that's the future for Citrus and Olbo and engineers around the world to help us look at clinical data and work very, very interdisciplinary on these issues so we'd be better at stratifying and giving the telehealth to the right persons. Yeah. Thank you so much for a fantastic talk.